thanks to God and the Father by Him. Not only does the Scripture tell us to be thankful, the Scripture also shows us how to be thankful. And so this Thursday, in fact today, whatever day, when you sit down to eat, I want you to know it's not just a tradition or a habit. It is biblical to pray before eating. Did you know that? Jesus gave us that example in John chapter 6, verse 11. It says, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set, sit down. Listen, at the feeding of the 5,000, it is no accident that Jesus took a little boy's lunch and blessed it, and then when he broke it, fed 5,000. Because, folks, when you're thankful for a little, God often blesses with a lot. Amen? Amen. I find that stingy, unthankful people are never satisfied with what they do have, let alone the blessing of even more. You know, Paul summed it up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. He said, in everything, give thanks. You know, one of the signs of the end times is ungrateful and unthankful people. In fact, God's Word teaches us. It says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves in the end times, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. You see, one of the signs of and end times attitude towards God is unthankfulness. So let me ask you today, are you thankful? Are you thankful for what God has blessed you with? Because we all have been given so much. I told the first service I ought to write a song. I am so thankful, so much, so much, so much for what God has given. Amen? Listen, those aren't the exact words, but maybe we can sing it a little later. I am so thankful. You know, I, I like that song. It just says so much, so much, so much. That's how thankful we need to be. In our text, we see five things about how thankful we should be. First of all, our text tells us that we ought to be thankful because he has qualified us. You say, what does that mean? Well, Let's look at verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. God has qualified us to receive His inheritance both in glory. By the way, the believer receives it the moment they receive Christ. The word meet means to be made fit or to qualify. The Greek word is haikano, and it means to make sufficient or to qualify. You know, Dr. William Mounts is one of the, the great Greek New Testament scholars, and, and he says that word meet, haikano, it, it means to, to make fit. You see, I wasn't fit for heaven. I was born with a sinful nature. I was born into a sinful world. And I committed sin. L listen, sin just came naturally to me. From the time I came out of my mother's womb, the Bible says, I had that sin nature and would naturally commit sin. Before you start judging the preacher too hardly, by the way, you did too. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have a sin nature. We weren't fit for heaven. But friend, listen to me. When the believer receives Christ, the Bible says he makes us fit for heaven. He qualifies us. He makes us sufficient for heaven. Listen, there was nothing inside me that was sufficient for heaven. I had that sin nature that I had to be dealt with. But God's the one that made me fit. What is the inheritance of the saints? It's the eternal. It's not only the quantity of eternal life, 
It's the quality of having a relationship with God. Listen, the Father has given the Son, and when we receive the Son, we receive the Holy Spirit that fills us. We become one with God. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Listen, we receive that which is eternal. And only the saints in light have been qualified or made right for heaven. Now what does it mean to be a saint? It means to be saved. The word saint means set apart. It doesn't mean an office that's voted on by some church somewhere. If you're a believer, you're a saint. You've been set apart. That word saint and the word sanctified comes from the same Greek root. It means set apart for God. Have you been set apart for the Lord? If you're saved, you have been. (laughs) When I received Christ, I became a saint. You don't have to refer to me as Saint Doug. But I could refer to you as Saint John, Saint Danielle, Saint Jay, and... uh, just looking around, St. Joe, there already is another St. Joe, I think, but, uh, but lots of saints in here, St. Mark. Uh, l- listen, there's a, uh, when you're a Christian, you become a saint. You're set apart for the Lord. Listen, that's what it means. And when you're a saint, guess what? You become a saint in light. Listen, I had to be saved from the darkness and brought into the light. And only Jesus can do that. You know, many races have qualifying runs because you're not fit to run in the final race if you can't get through the qualifying. And and you see that in the Olympic Games. These people train, they exercise, they practice. You know, they also do these kind of qualifying runs for car races too. You see that in NASCAR. NASCAR. Everybody, anybody here a NASCAR fan? Y'all know what NASCAR stands for? Non-athletic sports centered around rednecks, right? Isn't that what it stands for? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, I, I, I never watch the start of a race. I always watch the end, right? Because in between the start and the end, all they do is turn left. Turn left. Turn left. Now every once in a while they'll go on one of those tracks where where they'll turn right. I would think that would confuse those folks because they've turned left so many times. But but, but NASCAR, they run a qualifying run. And and, and you've seen those qualifying runs. I think for the most part when they're qualifying, they just run by themselves. That's why I always wonder, how do they have an accident when they're running by themselves? But they do, you know. I mean, uh, I've seen that happen. But they have to see whether or not the driver and the car is fit for the final race, the big race. And so they tune those cars. They tinker with those cars. You know, they even change the tires based on what the weather's like, how hot it is and how cold it is and They call that setting up the car. You know what a lot of people do? They make the mistake of thinking that they can qualify themselves. They try to act religious. They they, they think, well, if I go to church, maybe that'll make me right with God. They they think, maybe if I give an offering, that would make me right with God. Maybe if if I get baptized, that would make me right with God. Let me tell you, the only thing that makes us qualified or right with God is receiving Jesus. The reason why we attend and worship, the reason why we give, the reason that we're baptized is not in order to be qualified for heaven. The reason we do whatever we do is because we're thankful that Jesus qualified us for heaven. Where would I be without the Lord? He alone was able to pay the price for my sinfulness. The Bible says that only God can qualify us for heaven. And He did that when He sent the Son to pay the price for our sin. Well, second of all, He delivered us. 
Look at verse 13. It says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? God has delivered us from the power of darkness. That word delivered means to be rescued from danger. I remember one time I was rescued from danger. I went to a place called Tex-Mex Cantina. And uh, I was eating fajitas. Now, y'all remember this just in case I do this again. This was a good 25 years ago. Somehow that fajita it went down the wrong pipe. My wife was just a talking. I looked over at this deacon that had taken me out. His name was Stanton Smith. And I had this look in my eye like, I'm going to die. I stood up. I sat down. I thought, I am going to die. Donna's still talking. <laughs> Stanton calmly got up, walked around, and did that Heimlich uh, maneuver. It was a removal, too. Uh, I tell you, I was able to breathe. He rescued me from danger. That's a good story. But it's not near as good as what Jesus did for me. Because when me and my family were caught in sin and darkness, after my father died, my mother had a nervous breakdown and knew that she needed to get a, another daddy and another husband, or at least she thought she did. It seemed like every daddy and every husband, every six months, was an alcoholic. Our whole family was lost in darkness. But I'm so thankful that one day somebody came and shared the light of Jesus with me. A little girl who cared about me and told me that God loved me invited me to church. And when I heard the gospel, I was saved from the darkness and delivered into the light. Oh, listen, not just me. My mother and my last alcoholic stepfather, they came to church. They walked down the aisle. They gave their heart to Jesus. God delivered my whole family from darkness to light. You know why he was my last alcoholic stepfather? Because we didn't need another one. He got saved, amen? amen. Let me tell you, they, they not only stayed married, it's amazing what they're able to do with money that they're not spending on alcohol, amen? God changed everybody's life, delivered us from darkness and sin into the light of Jesus Christ. Oh, listen, I'm glad that God delivered me from that power of darkness. That power of darkness means to be condemned because of sin. We were shackled by sin. We were bound for a devil's hell. I like that song we sang, being bound for glory. Because <laughs> no longer was I bound for a devil's hell. I was bound for the kingdom of God. Amen. I was bound for for glory. I have so much to be thankful for and so do you if you're a believer. You've been qualified for heaven by Jesus. Listen, you've been delivered by the Lord, but then third, you've been translated. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, let's look. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That word translated just simply means to be transferred. I like that, to be transferred. I was transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. The Bible says believers have been transferred by their relationship with Jesus. You see, it's not by what we do. It's by what Jesus has done. I'm so thankful that he moved us from darkness to light. You know, my brother-in-law served in the military and the Navy for a full career. From Vietnam to, uh, to, to serving after Katrina as a commander, he made that jump of a non-commissioned officer and, and, and just kept going, I, I tell you. But, but one of the things he liked about the military was being transferred. Now, I'm not one that likes a lot of change and moving around. But he said, I, I like moving around in the military because 
You always got a new chance to start over. <laughs> you know, that's what Jesus did when he transferred me from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. I got the opportunity to start over. Maybe you're here today. You need to start over. Do you need a new start in life? Listen, that's what Jesus does when he transfers us from sin to life, from darkness to light. Listen, I'm thankful for that relationship that transfers us. You know, that's, that's what Jesus did. He gave me a new name, Christian. He gave me a new family, the Lord Jesus and His church. Oh, listen to me. He not only gave me a new beginning, but He gave me a new ending point too. No longer was I bound for hell. I was bound for glory. Listen, I'm thankful. I'm thankful also because He redeemed us. That's a good word, redeemed. Look at verse 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood. He redeemed us through His blood, through His death on a rough, rugged cross. We've been bought by our Lord. Redeem means to be delivered by a payment of a ransom. You see, the devil and sin, it held me. But Jesus paid the price for my sin. He paid that ransom so that I would be set free. Twenty-two times in the New Testament, this word redeemed appears, and it means to be bought back. Listen, I'm thankful that when I was a slave to sin, I was bought by the Lord and set free. Oh, listen, that the closest English word we have to that word redeemed in the Bible is the word emancipated. <laughs> because you ever heard of the Emancipation Proclamation? Abraham Lincoln in uh, January of 1863 with a, a single word, a proclamation declared there'd be no more slavery in America. Listen, that was a wonderful moment. I'm going to tell you a greater moment. It was when God declared that I was free from sin, that I had been bought with a price. Jesus paid the price. John 19, verse 30, is a picture of Jesus hanging on a cross. There hanging on the cross, You've heard of the seven last words of the cross? One of those last words was a Greek word, tetelestai. Jesus hanging on that cross, suffering for our sin, his rich royal blood being poured out. He cried out, tetelestai. What did that word mean? It means it is paid for. Oh, he was saying the sin debt of the world has been paid for. There, as he was giving up the ghost, the sin of the entire world, your sin and my sin, was placed on Jesus. And Jesus declared, it is paid for. It is done. It is finished. Amen. Amen. Oh, I am thankful that Jesus redeemed me. He bought me back. But then fifth, he forgave me. Verse 14 wraps up with this. Even the forgiveness of sin. I'm so thankful that God said to me, you're forgiven. You know, those are some of the most beautiful words, aren't they? When you have sinned and done wrong, and you hear those words, you're forgiven. Friend, listen to me. That's the word of God today. You're forgiven. And because we've been forgiven, we need to be forgiven. You see, God forgave our sin. Forgiveness means to pardon a penalty. The Hebrew have four words for the word forgiveness. One of them means to send away. Like that, like that goat 
the sin-bearing goat was set free to take the sins away. It was a picture. The goat really didn't take the sins away. Jesus takes the sins away. It's a picture of what, what happens to sin when, when the Messiah would come and die to pay for the sin, to, that the sins would be taken away. Aren't you glad your sins have been taken away? Oh, the second Hebrew word means to lift a burden. I'm telling you, when I walked down an aisle and knelt down and prayed for God to save me, it was like the burden was lifted away. Have you had the sin burden lifted off of you? Have you experienced that freedom, that pardon that comes? The third Hebrew word means to cover. I'm so thankful that when Adam and Eve sinned that God made a covering suitable to cover their sin. That was a picture because an innocent animal had to die. Oh, listen to me. Our innocent Savior, the Lord Jesus, died on a rough, rugged cross, and it is His blood that covers us so that when the Father sees us, He doesn't see our sin. He sees the Son, the Lord Jesus. I'm so thankful for the covering that covers my sin. The fourth word means to blot out. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. He paid a debt he didn't know. Listen, I needed someone to take my sin away. To blot out means that when you owe a bill, it's just marked out. That's what Jesus did for me. The Greek word for forgiveness is the word aphesis. And it means to cancel a debt. The old songwriter said, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Oh, listen, what about your life? Have your sins been washed away? Are you clean? Not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus did. Do you have a relationship with him? Do you know for certain that if you were to die right now, do you know that you would go to heaven? Listen, I'm thankful for forgiveness. Well, you have something to be thankful for today, don't you? God has qualified you. He's made you fit to have a relationship with Him through the death of Jesus. He has delivered you. He has rescued you from sin and darkness. He has translated you. He's moved you into His family. He's redeemed you and bought you back with the suffering on the cross, and He has forgiven you of all sins when you ask Jesus in your heart. Are you thankful today? Listen, if you're a believer, you have something to be thankful for. But now I've got good news for you because you may be here today and you're not a believer. But even though you haven't believed in Christ, here's some things you can be thankful for. First of all, you can be thankful that God loves you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you're here today and, and you're not a Christian, I want you to know God loves you. You know why a lot of people don't come to the Lord? Because they don't know they're loved. And today, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, I want you to know God loves you. He doesn't love our sin, but He loves you. Well, second of all, I want you to be thankful for the fact that Jesus came to warn us of an awful place called hell. And so if you're here today and you're not a believer yet, you ought to be thankful that God loved you enough to warn you of the awfulness of a place called hell. Because God doesn't want you to go there. And the third thing you can be thankful for is that Jesus died so that if you would receive Christ into your heart, you could be saved. Let me tell you, it wouldn't be a very thanksgiving if you don't know Jesus. 
But this year, you can have the greatest thanksgiving you've ever had if you receive Christ into your heart. Listen, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the opportunity today to share with you that you can have eternal life. If you repent from sin, that means to turn away from living for sin, and you turn to live for Jesus. It doesn't mean that you'll never ever sin again, but it will mean that if you ask Jesus in your heart, you don't want to sin anymore, that you want to live for Christ. Are you willing to repent from sin and turn to Jesus and say, Lord, I want to live for you? Would you like to do that today? Would you like to know that if you were to die, you'd go to heaven because you've been translated, you've been redeemed, you've been bought? Would you like to receive Christ today and know that you've been forgiven? I'm going to ask every head be bowed and every eye closed. Father, I pray for us now that if there's a man or a woman, a teenager, boy or girl who today needs to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that as we stand to sing, that they would step out and come to receive you. Father, it's not by our good works. It's by receiving the work of Jesus on a rough, rugged cross that comes when we receive Christ as Lord, the boss of our life, and our Savior, the forgiver of our sins. Father, I pray that if there's someone here that needs to make that commitment today, they would not hesitate, but the moment we stand, they would step out and come. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, do you need to come today? If you'd say, Pastor, I don't know for sure that if I were to die, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know right now, wherever you are, would you stand up and start coming? Would you come and receive Christ today? Maybe you're here and you need to join the church. God has already spoken to you about being a part of Uly Baptist Church. I urge you to stand and come and say, Today is my day to come and be a part of Uly Baptist. I believe God would have me to move my membership and be a part of this wonderful church family. I urge you to come. Maybe you're a believer and sin has gotten in the way. You need to come and recommit your life to the Lord. Again, if you need to come and receive Christ, don't leave this place without knowing for certain that Jesus is in your heart and that you've received all of these things that you can be thankful for. Father, I pray for us today. Father, I pray that as we stand to sing, if someone needs to come, Father, I pray they'd step out and come right away. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand?